Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. It's good for us to be able to open God's Word together. Um, As you know, or most of you, I trust, we're going through the book of Daniel. If you're visiting with us, we began a few weeks ago and we'll conclude that towards the end of November. Uh, This morning, we turn in our Bibles to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel 4, you can join us as you turn in your Bibles or watch watch the, the text on the screen. The Word of God from Daniel chapter 4. I've said this a few times, but the passages in Daniel are rather lengthy ones, but yet important for us to hear, I think. So we'll read through all of the verses in Daniel chapter 4. First words from Nebuchadnezzar to the surrounding nations and his people. King Nebuchadnezzar. To the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. He's called Belteshazzar after the name of my God and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, Cut down the tree and trim off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of these wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds, 
Your Majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. Your Majesty saw a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field, while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass for him. This is the interpretation, Your Majesty. And this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty... Be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as my royal residence? by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, What have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Thus far, our reading from God's Word. About 70 years ago, a man named J.B. Phillips had written a book called, Is Your God Too Small? Is Your God Too Small? And in that book, he unpacks common perceptions about how people think of God. Some of those ways of thinking or conceptualizing God are actually quite unbiblical and can often have a very negative impact on how people follow Jesus or how they serve his kingdom. Is God like an old grandfather sitting in heaven on an easy chair welcoming the little children on his lap? Or is God like an all-powerful ruler who has authority over all people and nations? Does God really have the power to change the heart of a tyrant like Nebuchadnezzar? Or to bring it closer to home, does God really have the power to change the heart of someone we know and love? Maybe a family member of ours. Is God really in control of history? What could God possibly be up to in our day as a tyrant named Putin 
invades a neighboring country called Ukraine. And how on earth is that going to fit into God's sovereign plan for the good of humanity? There are all kinds of time in our lives when, when we ask those kinds of questions, aren't there? And when we think about those questions, often that question that J.B. Phillips posed in his book kind of lingers in our mind. Is our God too small? We remind ourselves this morning that those questions undoubtedly were running through the minds of our spiritual ancestors centuries ago who were held captive in Babylon, displaced from their own country and home, far from home, far from their temple, far from all of the things that gave their lives a sense of belonging and purpose. They asked themselves, can we trust in a God whose power seems to have been displaced by an even greater power? In fact, the most powerful empire on the then known earth? And if God is truly our king, then why is it that King Nebuchadnezzar seems to have all the glory and the power and the wealth and the honor? In fact, historians would say perhaps more than any other king in ancient history. Well, Daniel 4 speaks to those kinds of questions and it tells the story of two kings two sovereign rulers and it forces us to think about how powerful God really is this is actually the last story in the book of Daniel where we encounter a king named Nebuchadnezzar and it's estimated that about 20 years have passed since Nebuchadnezzar had that first troubling dream. Remember in chapter 2, he was troubled, left sleepless? Well, it's estimated that was about 20 years before he has this, his second troubling dream that left him sleepless. And in those approximately 20 years, we aren't certain, it would seem that some of the things that Daniel had shared with Nebuchadnezzar in that first dream had now come to pass. Remember, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar back in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, you are that head of gold. Remember the dream of the statue? He said in, da in Daniel 2 verse 37, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he's placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are that head of gold. And in our chapter, now some 20 years or so later... That's precisely what's come to pass, isn't it? A biblical scholar by the name of John Golden Gay, drawing on what we know of historically and archaeologically, invites us to imagine this picture. Think about verse 29 in the passage we read, where we read of Nebuchadnezzar walking on the roof of his royal palace in Babylon. Golden Gay imagines with us what he might have seen. Very likely, the, the roof of the palace was a flat roof so that he could relax and walk there in the cool breeze. And from there, he could look down on the great processional avenue, which he had paved with, with limestone and decorated with all kinds of lion figures. He also had a magnificent view of a temple that he had built for his god, Marduk. And alongside that temple was an enormous tower that he had constructed. Not unlike the tower that's referred to in Genesis chapter 11. You know the story of the Tower of Babel, where the people at the time gathered on the plains of Shinar to reach the heavens with a tower. Well, Nebuchadnezzar had a large 300-foot tower next to that temple 
which undoubtedly filled him with pride. And moreover, across the city were about 50 plus temples that he either built or beautified that adorned and gave the city such majesty. Not to mention the glorious city walls and gates that surrounded it. One writer says, Babylon was one of the preeminent cities of history. And during Nebuchadnezzar's reign, the most magnificent and probably the largest city on earth. And Nebuchadnezzar's dream is in a very real sense a vivid image or a metaphor of exactly this rooftop view that Nebuchadnezzar might have been taking in that day on top of his palace. And it's an image that we find in other places in the scripture, especially in Ezekiel chapter 31. You might want to read that later today. But not just in scripture, we find this image of a great tree in records from other ancient Near Eastern cultures as well. Recently, when I was in Egypt, visiting the Karnak temple in Luxor, I saw this carving on the side of one of the temple walls of a great tree. This is the tree of life. Next to it is the Pharaoh who has been given authority and responsibility, who in some ways embodies what this tree represents. So this image that Nebuchadnezzar would have seen in his dream would have been an image common in the ancient Near East, an image that, that depicted his his power, but also his ability to, to give life and to cause his empire to flourish. So when Nebuchadnezzar sees in his dream a holy one, a messenger, more literally a watcher coming down from heaven, cutting the tree, destroying the tree, no wonder he was troubled. we're reminded of another story. I alluded to it. We can maybe turn that slide off, uh, Noah. I alluded to it a moment ago. That other story when people constructed this enormous tower, we're reminded of one who also had to come down, God coming down, to bring to an end the pride-filled building project of those people scattering them by confusing their language. Well, Nebuchadnezzar sees one coming down, a holy one, a messenger, a, a watcher, more literally. No wonder Nebuchadnezzar was troubled. And so was Daniel. We read in verse 19, Daniel was greatly perplexed for a time. His thoughts terrified him. Belteshazzar, the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream and its meaning alarm you. But Daniel replied, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. Undoubtedly, Daniel was troubled, not wanting to, to give this news to the king. But we're struck by his reaction. In fact, even though our text is principally about, about God and his power to bring down kings and raise them up, we notice something in Daniel that's, I think, maybe worth paying attention to, a kind of sub-point of truth in our passage. Daniel's response is quite surprising. I could imagine that Daniel might be thinking to himself, finally, Nebuchadnezzar is going to get what's due him. Finally, God is going to cut him down and maybe taking some pleasure in that. I don't know about you, but every now and then, I'm ashamed to say, when certain things happen to certain people that are negative, I, I sometimes find myself taking pleasure in that. The Germans have a good word for it, schadenfreude, and it means experiencing pleasure or joy that comes from learning or witnessing the troubles or failures of another person. 
There's no evidence of schadenfreude in Daniel's response. Though perhaps sometimes we notice in our own hearts that kind of response, taking pleasure when someone else is brought low. We can't help wonder if Daniel is already showing us what Jesus says about how we're called to love our enemies. Daniel goes on, you are that tree. What the Lord has shown you through that dream some 20 years ago has now come to pass and the kingdom will be taken away from you and restored only when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, we read, may your majesty be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what's right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Nebuchadnezzar was puffed up and full of pride and the Lord was about to bring him down. That, I suggest, may be a second sub-point, if you will, in our text that we're invited to ponder on. It would be easy for us to skip over and quickly say, ah, Nebuchadnezzar, he's so distant from us. I mean, look at him. He has all the wealth, all the glory, all the honor. He built his cities with slave labor. He's nothing like you and me. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar feels distant to us. But each of us know that at the core, we're all tempted at times to exalt ourselves. Consider these words from a more recent writer by the name of A.W. Tozer, describing sin. Maybe we can put that on. I lost ability to control. Sin has many manifestations, he writes, but its essence is one. A moral being created to worship before the throne of God sits on the throne of their own selfhood, and from that elevated position declares, I am. That is sin, writes Tozer, in its concentrated essence. Yet because it is natural, it's part of our fallen condition, it appears to be good. What shall we do? You remember that question, that's what the crowds ask Peter after he delivers that Pentecost sermon. What shall we do? This, says Tozer, is the deep heart cry of every person who suddenly realizes that they are a usurper and that they sit on a stolen throne. God warns Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel and calls Nebuchadnezzar to repentance. But we read in our text that 12 months later, 12 months, it would seem God was patient with Nebuchadnezzar, gave him a whole year. 12 months later, we read that as he's walking on his palace rooftop in verse 30, is this not the great Babylon I, and that's the first occurrence of that word, is this not the great Babylon that I have built as my royal residence? And by my mighty power, that's the second occurrence. And for the glory of my majesty, that's the third occurrence. Three times in the Bible, a symbolic word meaning fullness, complete. Nebuchadnezzar was completely full of himself. And God brings him low. The warnings in the dream come to pass. Remember how in chapter 2, when Daniel says about Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold, we read it earlier, in your hands he has placed all the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Now Nebuchadnezzar is driven low so that he's one of the beasts in the field. A few years ago when I was on sabbatical, a number of you will know, my family and I spent a good amount of time in Europe, in the Netherlands primarily, but also for a little bit in Germany and France. We were going to visit a missionary couple that I knew who were serving in Berlin 
and we stayed with them for about five days or so. And leading up to our Berlin experience, when we were in the Netherlands, I started watching this Netflix series called Hitler, Hitler's Circle of Evil. You can still watch it on Netflix if you're interested in that kind of stuff. And that documentary kind of traces the rise to Hitler's power, the way in which so many saw him as almost a kind of Messiah figure, a savior figure. We saw Hitler puffed up full of grandiosity, full of this vision to create a new world order. And by the end of the series, Hitler is a pathetic man whose body is full of drugs, addicted to them. By the end, we know he's hiding away in a bunker and he kills himself. The story of how God can bring tyrants low is a story that we can find throughout history. We might even think of that as a contemporary Nebuchadnezzar story. But notice this in our story. God's intention is to bring Nebuchadnezzar to repentance, to bring him to conversion, to bring him to a place in his own heart where he would step off the stolen throne and surrender it to God. Listen to the words that come from Nebuchadnezzar after his heart has been changed. At the end of that time, we read in Daniel 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? God, in his sovereign power, was determined to change the heart of a tyrant who was sitting on a stolen throne. And we can be assured that God remains on the throne of history, even to this day. He can bring down those who are puffed up, and he can change the heart of those who are, as we said, sitting on a stolen throne. Towards the beginning of the sermon, I I asked the kinds of questions that undoubtedly some are feeling about Russia's invasion in Ukraine and the bloodshed and the damage that's being done there. Christianity Today, a magazine that I read, had an article earlier this year talking about the Ukrainian population in New York City, which is quite large, about 150,000 people. And it had a description there of a worship service where many Ukrainians were gathered. The title of the article was The Ukrainian American Churches Deploy Praise as a Weapon. As nuclear threat was escalating and continues to be the case today, as you know, one of the church leaders told Christianity Today this, our minds fail to understand. How is it possible in this day and age God allows this to happen? We do not know why, but we know God is sovereign, and he is on the throne. There are people who think if they kill someone, it will accomplish a goal. The worship leader said, our hope is in the Lord, the one who holds all things together. No matter how things fall apart, the Lord created this world, and he holds things in his hands. He played music, the article goes on to say, led worship in tears and told his church family, even if a nuclear attack happens, the hope we have is we go home and we will be together with Jesus, the one we know will help us. As our spiritual ancestors were held in captivity in Babylon so many centuries ago, wondering whether their king, God, was truly on the throne. Through the message of our story in Daniel 4, they heard powerfully what that Ukrainian worship leader said to his congregation earlier in February. Our hope is in the Lord, the one who holds all things together. In our day, we're reminded of another tyrant. 
In the New Testament, this person is referred to as the ruler or the prince of this world, the god of this age. He has the name the Satan or the adversary. But God has sent one who came down from heaven to defeat this intruder. In John's gospel, we read that now this prince of the world will be driven out. And this King Jesus, our Savior, says to us, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Jesus speaks of another tree, a tree that represents this kingdom. We read about it in Mark 4. What's the kingdom of God like, Jesus says? How do we describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when planted, it grows and, and becomes the largest of all garden plants. Matthew says it becomes a large tree and all the birds come and perch in its branches. The allusion to Daniel 4 is a clear one. But, but why the change from this enormous tree in Daniel 4 to an enormous garden shrub, a mustard shrub, in Jesus' parable? Well, very likely, Jesus is saying to us that the kingdom that he is ushering in will not be a mighty international empire, but one that operates in much more subtle ways, changing the hearts and lives of people, transforming them in such a way that their presence on the world will transform society. We serve a great and glorious and all-powerful God who knows us, who hasn't forgotten us, and who has the power to bring down whatever events might be necessary to change human hearts. How does that translate for you and I in our ordinary lives? God has the power, we read, to change even the hearts of a great king like Nebuchadnezzar. Surely our God is not small. There are people that you and I pray for, asking that God would change their hearts. And he does. God knows us. God knows our prayers. God is able to do, the New Testament says, much more than we can imagine. I was reminded of that this week in a visit that I had with a young family in our church. They've been worshiping with us for, I think, about three or four years or so. And they shared with me their story of coming to our church. <clears throat> Initially, they were sending their children to the beehive and were quite blessed by what their kids were experiencing there. And, and as it happened, kind of felt maybe God is calling us to, to go to church. Our kids are learning about uh, Jesus and the Bible. And at one point, the wife said, well, there's a church right next door to the beehive. Maybe we could visit that church. She had grown up as a Christian and still was a believer, but had not been going to church for a time. And, and he had never gone to church as a child, just to Sunday school, had an uncle who really encouraged him when he was growing up. They thought to themselves, can we just show up in church? Do we have to get permission from somebody? Like, are we allowed to just go there on a Sunday morning? As someone who grew up a Christian, I find that hard to believe, but it's true. Many people feel very intimidated stepping into a place like this, wondering, can I be here? But God knew exactly what this couple needed, particularly what the husband needed. Because that first Sunday when they walked through the door, wouldn't you know, one of our longtime members greeted them and said, hey, by the way, I have permission to share this story, and said, hey, what are you doing here? So good to see you. Turns out that these folks had known each other in business for many, many years. And at that moment, the husband thought, I know somebody there. And I thought to myself, isn't that how God works? Sovereignly able to move people and direct people's lives in such a way that he raises them up 
and draws them to himself. Our God is not too small to accomplish much more than what you and I can imagine. He said that clearly to the displaced captives in Babylon in our story, and he reminds us of that today and perhaps calls us to pray in a way that we haven't prayed before, to share the gospel with someone knowing that it's God's job to change their heart. Ours is simply to share the love of Christ. God can do much more than we imagine. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people say, Amen. Amen.